what do I mean by this? Well, this will be one of the few diagrams I attempt to draw, actually. Uh, take, for instance, a parabola. <coughs> and uh, why don't we, I don't know, for instance, uh, make this out of paper. Yeah, this nice piece of paper. Okay, and let's just stop it somewhere. And I don't want it to be infinite. Okay, so I have this nice flat sheet of paper, and I cut a parabola out of it. And then, uh, well, I make a little teeny incision on the bottom uh, and kind of make a place where I could stick a drill bit into the bottom. And I stick it on a power drill, okay, and then I plug in the power drill, and I go... All right, and that thing starts right, spinning around as fast as you can, right? And if you watch it, what's it doing in the air, right? It, I mean, it doesn't look flat anymore, right? It, what is it? it actually starts to look like this nice three-dimensional image in your, in your brain, yeah? Okay, so all of a sudden this thing starts spinning around this way, and it appears, at least to us, to have some depth to it. Of course, it, it doesn't. It's still just a flat piece of paper spinning around. Okay, But I don't care about what it is in actuality. I care about what we see. Right? And what we see <coughs> is some three-dimensional object that we obtain by taking some area, okay, and then a region, maybe a better word, and rotating it around, well, this is the y-axis. Okay? And... Well, because I started here not just with an outline of a parabola, but with a nice flat sheet of paper, right? if this really, if you did have this, this solid that you get from it, right, it really would be solid, right? I mean, it's all filled in in the middle, right? As you rotate all these points around, you're getting all the points in the middle. It's not hollow. That's the point. Okay? So that's why, it, of course, it's a solid, because it's, it's not hollow. Okay? And why do we call it a revolution? Well, because it's revolving. Right? Okay, so that's all... That's all we're getting at. Okay, so what we would like to do is figure out a way to find these volumes. And you will probably be incredibly surprised to find out that we're going to do it using calculus. Yeah. What a shocker. All right. Now, the way I want to do this is instead of um, showing you a lot of solids and then trying to solve them and, and showing you some weird stuff, uh, I eventually just want to sit down and, and show you, based on certain situations, right, very basic pictures, and wh where you're revolving them, what sort of integral you're going to set up. Okay, I want to try to make this as, as straightforward as possible, because I know that typically this is a part of the course where people mm, have some difficulties. Right? So it's a little more technically challenging to some people. Okay. Uh, so why don't we just, we'll just start it off, right? And once we get these basic ideas out, right, the basic formulas, right, how to solve these, then we can go back and justify these formulas later on, see where they're coming from. But let's just start by actually being able to solve the problems, okay? So we're going to start by uh, looking at a picture. And I'm going to give a name to the method, but you don't really have to worry about the name until later on, right? The name will be motivated later. Okay. So, uh, actually, I want to I draw two different pictures. And, and what we're going to see here is that uh, there's always going to be two different pictures. Right? For each one of the, the formulas I give you, there's going to be a formula where we have x's, and we're going to have a formula where we have y's. And what that's going to correspond to <coughs> is either rotating right, around a vertical line or a horizontal line. Right? And we're always going to try to make it, in the end, that the vertical line is the y-axis, excuse me, and the horizontal line is the x-axis. Okay. So the first method right, will eventually be called the disk method. Okay, but don't worry about this name. It's just a way to organize things right now. The picture is what I want you to remember. Okay. So we're going to start with a region. It looks like this. We're going to draw some nice function. This should look familiar. 
and we're going to assume that that function lies above the x-axis. This function lies above the x-axis. And we're looking at the area first, bounded, between two points A and B, <coughs> the x-axis, and f of x. Okay, now if I wanted you to find the area under this curve, of course you know how to do it. Right? Just set up the definite integral from a to b of f of x dx. Okay? But what if I wanted you to take this region and I want to take a power, this power drill, and hook it up right there, right? Right at the corner, and I'm going to turn on the power drill and it's going to spin like this. Right? And it makes this nice solid going around. Right? So it's going to rotate about the x-axis. Can we get the volume out of this? Right? Well, later on I'll justify this formula, but for now, right, I'm just going to write down a formula and maybe just give a, a very short justification for it. Okay, so V is going to represent the volume of this area we get. Right? So here we're, mind you, we're rotating about the x-axis. Okay, so let's move this down just slightly. And the V is going to be pi. Uh, pi is going to show up quite a bit in these. We'll see why in a second. Then we're going to integrate. Ah, uh, this is good. We have calculus involved. Okay, from A to B. This is not so bad. We're going to integrate the function. Now, if we just did it like this, <coughs> things would not be good, yeah? Because we would actually just have this area times pi, which is unlikely to be the volume. <laughs> okay, so what's going to end up having to happen is you're going to have to have this square in here. Okay, now, where is this formula coming from? Okay, well, forget about the integral for a second. Forget about the dx. Just think pi f of x squared. Okay, let me add some extra parentheses just so we are very clear what we're doing. We're squaring the whole function. So pi f of x squared, pi something squared. What is that? Pi something squared. That's the area of, exactly, pi r squared, right? It's the area of a circle. Okay? So the way this is arising, when you rotate this around, okay, well, there's a circle that's being formed, right? When you rotate this around. Okay? Now, of course, a circle doesn't have any volume by itself. Okay? But if you made it just a little bit thicker, just a little bit thicker, take a circle, right? And now just extend it a little bit. Right? Imagine a slinky. Okay? Imagine you look at a slinky from above, right? All you see is a circle. Okay? But now you move on down, right? And all of a sudden it's a, it's a cylinder. Okay? So a cylinder does have some volume. Okay? It's got the area of the top of the circle times whatever the height of your cylinder is. So you have pi r squared on the top, and then whatever the height is. Okay, and the volume is just the product of these two. Okay. Well, what this dx term is doing, that dx term is somehow the height of the cylinder. Right? And it's actually coming from, well, a delta x, right? which is what you would expect if you had this integral. Okay? And so what you're going to end up doing is taking a limit as the number of these cylinders goes to infinity, and the width, the delta x, goes to zero. Right? That's what dx is, is what happens, right? That's the, that, thing's going, that means the delta x is going to zero, and you're integrating all over all of them from a to b. Okay? And this pi, well, originally is on the inside, but it, you can pop it out because it's a constant. Okay? So, so that's, the, that's the basic justification. We'll draw, maybe we'll draw some pictures later on if we want to. Okay? So it's very easy, right? It's whenever you have a function which is positive, okay, goes between a and b, 
you rotate it around the x-axis, you want to know the volume that you get, just plug it into this formula. Okay. Now, what if <coughs> we wanted to do the same thing, but everything gets rotated that way? Okay, so now we're going to go, say, from C to D. We have a function. Well, this function is not going to be a function of x. Right? When you go this way, you're going to have a function of y. Let me write it as g of y. Okay. And now this function is positive, right? meaning the x value that you get in the end is positive. Right? And instead of rotating about the x-axis, we want to rotate around the y-axis. Can you see that this is actually the same problem? Yeah, you've just, you've just really rotated everything, right? You've just effectively replaced x's with y's, right? If you took everything in this formula and replaced the x with the y's, you would get exactly what, what picture you have here, right? So actually writing down this is, is nothing new. Rotating <coughs> about the y-axis. We get the volume is, uh, well, we're just going to copy the formula. Pi integral from A to B, and now instead of having uh, an f of x squared, we have a g of y squared, and we integrate with respect to y. Okay, well, all we do, the, the, the same formula. We just take all the x's and turn them into y's. Okay, maybe I renamed the f into a g. But. Oh, yeah, yeah, well, you see the d. Thank you. And again, that's just like changing the F into a G, right? C to D is just <coughs> different labels. So whenever you have a region which is positive, right, either as a function of X and you're going around the X axis, or is positive as a function of Y and you're going around the Y axis, okay, so these should match up, right? Function of X going around the X axis, function of Y going around the Y axis. Okay, whenever they match up, Okay, then you can use this formula with the appropriate either x or y. So this one is, is positive. Oh. Yeah, yeah, because mind you, we're looking here as a function of y. So x is a function of y. So all the x values all right, over here, there's no negative x values in here. So it's, well, I shouldn't say positive, but non negative anyway. So you don't have any negative x values. And same thing over here, you have no negative y values. <coughs> yeah? Oh, it's not that, I mean, it, it, one, well, one thing for certain is going to happen, right? Uh, you're always going to have problems um, if you have negative values in, right? We know that this is going to affect area calculations, for instance, right? And uh, it could affect volume calculations. We'll see that. We'll see that. We're going to use it actually. No, no, you're anticipating what we're going to do in a second. Uh, and this is good. Um, uh, we're going to see actually a very simple fix for it. All right. So we're starting with this restriction. But what we're going to see is that we can always get into, maybe not the disk case, but once we get a, a few cases out, that we can always get into one of those cases just by using this very simple fact. Huh? Okay, so is this. Is this clear what to do? We'll do examples uh, uh, later. I want to get all these methods out here. All right, is that okay? So let's draw another picture. Okay, so the next method, all right, is what is sometimes known as the washer method. Again, let's draw the picture. <coughs> so, the one thing which is very limiting about the disk method is that our picture is tied to the x-axis or to the y-axis. Okay? It, it has to be bounded by it. Okay? In the washer method, we allow ourselves to move away. Okay? And we allow ourselves to change this bottom from being just a nice straight line but to any function. So what we might have is, and 
again, we can always, let me move this down a little bit. We're always going to just write this down in the beginning as being positive. Right? And then later on, we'll see how to deal with things when they become negative. So let's draw a function, f of x. <coughs> and a function g of x. And then we're going to bound it between a and b. And I'm going to be looking at the area between these curves. Okay, so I make a few assumptions here. So on A, B, this function G should always be greater than or equal to 0. Okay, so that's our first thing. <coughs> and the second is that this g is also less than or equal to f of x. Okay. So we really, we don't, we're not worrying about situations where f of x and g of x might cross. Okay. So we're just in this nice, simple situation. Okay. And again, when things are given in terms of x here, we want to rotate around the x-axis. So we take this piece and we rotate it around. Now, what's the difference in what you're getting here? Yeah, this, this whole piece here, right, that also rotates around, but it's empty when you rotate it around. So you have this hole going down the middle. It's like a combo, but you've taken out all the good stuff. Right? You guys know what combos are? <laughs> I don't know if they make those anymore. <laughs> yeah, okay. So. But there's a really nice way to see what's going on as far as calculating the volume goes. If you didn't have this missing, right, if this was all here, then you would just be in this situation again. Right? You'd be right back to the disk method. Right? On the other hand, if you forget about trying to compute the volume of this thing rotated and you just try to compute the volume that you're missing, that you can actually compute by using the disk method. So all you have to do is compute the whole thing right, under f of x using the disk method, and then subtract what you would get if you did just the stuff under g of x using the disk method. So it's really somehow the washer method generalizes the disk method, but it uses the disk method. <laughs> I mean, in the end, it's not really a new method. right? It's just the disks again. That's the way you can think about it. So what's the volume? Well, all you have to do, right, as I said, is compute the volume as if you were doing all of f of x right, down to the x-axis, and then subtract what you'd be getting if you were doing the g of x down to the x-axis. And so you should get pi integral from a to b, <coughs> f of x squared, Minus, right, because each of these is the same thing, right? Pi integral f of x squared or pi integral g of x squared. So minus g of x squared dx. Okay, so this is again around the x axis. <coughs> Okay, now if we want to do the y-axis, well, again, it's, a, it's the same thing, right? You, you just turn this picture up on its side. You assume that right, you go from now c to d, right? Uh, that 0 is always less than or equal to g of y, is less than or equal to f of y, right? And you're rotating around the y-axis. Right? So, I, I, well, maybe we'll just draw a quick, tiny little picture here. So now you're, okay, here's your g of y, your f of y, there's a c, and a d, and you're, you're taking this and 
rotating it around the y-axis. Okay, so it's really the same thing. Right? And so if you go around <coughs> the y-axis, then the volume is what's well, the same formula. We just replace all the x's with y's. Right? The a, b with the c, d. Okay, my, so again here, right? Zero is less than or equal to g of y, less than or equal to f of y on the interval cd. Okay, so here we have f of y squared minus g of y squared. We integrate with respect to y. Hey, this isn't so bad. You know, half the formulas are just replace x's with y's. So, can the y be? That's right. So, if you're talking about a function of x, right? Y is a function of x. Then the vertical line test, right, is going to you're not allowed to have right these this sort of situation. But here we're we're replacing our situation where now. Y is not a function of X, but X is a function of Y. So the vertical line test becomes the horizontal line test. <laughs> now, okay, you, now if, you, if you wanted to see whether this is actually a function of Y, you have to use the horizontal line test to see if you get any duplicates. <coughs> right. uh, all you're doing is swapping everything right, and turning your head. <laughs> So everything works the same way. Of course, we're in this, you know, uh, we have this culture where everything's a function of x. You know. But uh, you, you're going to have to, you know, learn to be tolerant of other letters. That's what I'm saying. Okay. Uh, so, any questions about this this washer situation? Okay. So you, you can you can really see where it's coming from the disk situation. Yeah. It's, yeah. Oh, okay. So that, that's coming from the, the pictures here. When you, when you rotate this around, okay, the, the volume that you're using to approximate the volume right, looks like okay, so it's, but it's, I, I'm drawing it here like it's a rectangle, but it's actually it's like a little cylinder, okay, or a disk. So a disk, actually, in, you, you, when we talk about a disk in mathematics, we talk about things, something that's not hollow. Okay, so it's, it's actually filled in, and then it has a little bit of width. So it's actually a cylinder. Washer, uh, well, I'm, I'm not much of a handyman, but um, I believe in, you know, if you're a plumber or something, <laughs> you have these, uh, <coughs> these special things that go around your pipes or, you know, when you, you have your screws and they, they you, you've seen this, you, okay, you stick this, um, over the hole, then you stick the screw through it, right? And then you then you put the nut or whatever it's called the that spins around and touches. It. Okay, but this is called a washer, so it, it it's filled in with stuff. There's a hole in the middle, and you can stick the screw through. But unfortunately, that's as useful as I am around the house. <laughs> yeah, uh, so that's where they're coming up with this name, is it, this picture. Um, so the, the last uh, method, well, it really, there's two parts to it. Uh, well, let me just start with this, we'll call it the shell method. <coughs> and actually, very similar to the way the disk method gives you the washer method, right, as looking at just the difference of basically using the disk method twice, the shell method is also going to have a version, which is sometimes uh, very creatively called the difference of shells, as opposed to a nice name like washer. <coughs> this maybe should be called difference of disks, and then you might remember it better. OK, so uh, <coughs> the shell method is actually going to start as a very special case of the disk method. Right? So over here, we allowed that our x values could be, could be negative. Um, but now we're going to stick everything into the first quadrant, right? Just everything's going to go into the first quadrant. Um, and you might say, well, geez, that, 
doesn't seem like you're getting anything new. And you'd be right, except for one small point. Okay, so let's stick our curve over here. <coughs> and let's go between A and B. Okay, and again, we're going to go down to the, the x-axis. Okay, so here, uh, A is greater than or equal to 0 in this method. And f of x uh, is greater than or equal to 0. So if I told you to rotate this around the x-axis, then what method would you use? You just use the disk, right? We already have that. So what, what possible reason could I be having for redrawing this only now making a greater than or equal to 0? Hmm. Hmm. Well, there's one place I haven't rotated a function of x around yet. I rotated around the x-axis, but I didn't rotate it around the y-axis. Right? It may be the case right, that you have a nice function of x and a nice region right, bounded between a and b, and you want to rotate it this way. Right? You know, when, if you wanted to, for instance, um, I mean, you, you might think, well, why don't I just use the washer method on this? Right? Shouldn't that work? Well, remember, here you're bounding between two functions of y, okay, and then you have these nice flat tops. Notice over here, you'd, you're, you'd be bounding between two nice flat lines, but then you don't have a flat top anymore. So it's really not the same picture. Right? Now, there's going to be a few cases where they overlap and you get the same picture, but in general they're not. Okay, so you really need something different. So if I want to rotate this around the y-axis, <coughs> okay, we're gonna, we need a new formula. Okay, so when you do this, you use these things called cylindrical shells. Right? We'll try to uh, work on drawing some pictures of those later, but let me just write down the formula for you. And then maybe we'll just try to describe what's going on. So this will be the, the first time something slightly weird happens. Instead of having a pi, we're going to have a 2 pi. <laughs> See what I tell you? Weird. Okay. And of course, we will integrate from A to B. And then the, the weird bit happens. We're going to toss in an x. <coughs> and oops. oops, yeah, that's right, good. Just had one too many parentheses. Okay, we're going to toss in an x and multiply it by this f of x. Hmm, hmm. So where is this coming from? I mean, this just looks... Bizarre, yeah? Okay. So, so let's try to, to work out what's going on here. Um, what you're doing is you're trying to take a cylinder and instead of having it be a solid cylinder, we're going to actually have it just be a little bit thick. Okay. Okay, so it's, it's hollow down the middle. Okay, it's just like a tube. Okay, but it has some thickness to it. Okay, that's those are the things that we're sticking in here, right? Because when you rotate this around, what do you get? Well, you take it just a little sliver, like a little line, right? And rotate it around. 
And what are you getting? Well, you're getting this little thing rotating in a circle. And it's a little bit thick. And it's got a nice big hole in the middle. I used to be able to do that better when I was six. Okay, so you're just rotating this thing around, and you get this nice little <coughs> thin shell. Okay? Now, what's the volume of this shell? Hmm. Hmm. Well, let's see here. It's not solid, so you can't just take the top, right, and look at the area of the circle and then multiply by the height. Right, that's what we did over here. Okay. So what we do is we don't actually find the exact volume of this. We just approximate it. Okay. We take the circumference of the circle. What's the circumference of a circle? 2 pi r. Notice this 2 pi is shoving in here. Right? <coughs> okay. Then, okay. by the way, that, that x, that's your r. Um, then we multiply by the height. Okay, that's your f of x. And what, what would that actually give you? Well, if you took a circle and just took the circumference and multiply by the height, can you, can you figure out, let's say I just take this, I take the circumference and I multiply by the height. It's really the same picture as over there, but now I'm not computing the volume anymore. I'm taking 2 pi r, the circumference, and multiplying by the height, what would that be? The what? It'd be the surface area. Okay, how can you see it's the surface area? Well, if I had a pair of scissors, actually for a chalkboard I need something stronger than scissors, I guess. Okay, I just make a little incision and cut it up. Okay, just cut down the side here. Now, what would happen? Like, let's say you took a Oh, roll of paper towels, right? Take that little brown thing in the middle that you like to play swords with when you were kids. Right? Okay, so take that and cut it. Okay, what can you then do to it? You can, you can open it up and flatten it out. And when you flatten it out, what shape is it? It's a rectangle. What's the area of a rectangle? You've got to think about it. here. Let's, I see Dina gives me a, a funny look over there. So let's. Okay, well, certainly this is a rectangle, roughly. Yeah. Okay, now if I roll it up. Okay, now the trick, of course, is to, to just roll it up so the ends are touching, but let's just assume that I did that. You get a nice cylinder. Okay. If I cut it, <coughs> it opens up and it's back into a rectangle. And we know how to find the area of a rectangle, right? You just do the base, the base times the height. Okay, well, the height, that's the height of the original cylinder. What's the base? It's the circumference of that cylinder. Right? And of course, the circumference is 2 pi r. So the, air, the surface area of this thing is 2 pi r. Okay? So if we just left it as 2 pi times x times f of x, we would have the surface area of this thing. Yeah? What's the dx? That's the, the perfect question. Okay? Well, think of it first as a delta x. Okay? Because remember, this definition, right, is okay, there's a limit and then a sum. And then you have the function times delta x. Right? The delta x is the thickness of this thing. Right? You take the surface area and you multiply it by the thickness. Okay? And it should be pretty thin. Okay? But you multiply it by the thickness. And that gives you the volume approximately. It doesn't really give you the whole volume because you're actually getting a little too much. right? Because as you go in, you should, <coughs> you should be actually be getting less volume somehow, right? Because it's getting thinner as you go in. And if you made this a really thick, thick shell, it would be a really bad approximation. Okay, so the volume of this is approximately okay, 2 pi r, right? We're here, you have the radius. H is the height 
times, now I take this distance right here, and I call that delta x. Right. Okay, it's just the thickness of this. <coughs> okay. So somehow you can think about volume as area over time. For instance, you start with, a, say, a circle. Right? How do you make a cylinder out of a circle? Right, well, and not really a circle, but we'll say a disk, right? a real disk. So it's, cup, it's completely filled in. Okay? The area of that, that disk is 2 pi r. Okay, how do you make a, a cylinder out of it? Well, why don't you start walking with it? Okay? And you look at what region of space is mapped out by that circle as I walk. What do I get? I get a cylinder. Okay. Let's say instead of me actually having to move, I just view it over time. <laughs> okay. So time is moving. Okay. And whatever area is covered over time, say from zero to one second or whatever, okay, that's how we can define volume. Okay. So you can just think of these volumes. You have know, a cylinder, for instance, is just this area mapping out this volume. Right. And it's weird because the volume of any given circle should be zero. Right? It has no thickness to it. There's no volume. It has area, but no volume. Right? But taken continuously over time, it creates a volume. <coughs> okay, now here uh, you're taking, think of this, this shell. You could even think just of a, of a cylinder, right? a, a hollow cylinder that kind of moves in and out. It kind of pulsates. Okay, it grows and shrinks, grows and shrinks, grows and shrinks. Right? Now, the ones that are smaller give you less surface area. And as you get bigger, you get more surface area. Right? So if you, it'd be sort of like if we took this circle and instead of just walking like this, we kind of let it shrink a little bit over time. Right? And grow as you went backwards and shrink this way and grow. Right? It wouldn't be the same volume as if you just kept it the same, right? If you let it shrink, it's going to have a smaller volume. It's not quite right. And the same thing happens here. This formula does not quite give you the volume of this thing because you're making the surface area smaller as you, as you go in. But if this thing is sufficiently small, right, if this isn't very thick, then it's a good approximation. And as this thing goes to zero in the limit, then it, you actually get the volume right, when you add a, an infinite number of these things. OK, so that's where this formula is, is coming from. OK, okay now. There is, of course, the same formula when you have a function g of y, which is always positive, right? So you could have some g of y going from c to d. And you could rotate it around the x-axis instead. Okay, so you could just take this thing and you know, rotate it around. And you'll get a similar formula. Okay, just replace right, your x's with y's. <coughs> so maybe maybe we'll write that down. Okay. Are we oh, we're almost out of time. So if you so here C is greater than or equal to zero, as is G of Y. If you take this region and rotate it around the x axis, okay, then we use again the shell method. x-axis, and we get that the volume is 2 pi times the integral from c to d of g, uh, y g of y dy. Okay.
Okay, so I just want to show you one more method, right, which is the extension of the shells to differences. So difference of shells. Right, so remember, disks gave you difference of disks, which we called washers, and shells are going to give you difference of shells. Okay, so what's the, the picture going to be? So the picture, when we have a difference of shells, it's going to look the same, only now we're not going to be restricted right, to being bounded by the x-axis here. Okay. We're going to make this nicer. <coughs> okay. We'll bound between A and B. Mind you, again, this is going to be a first quadrant region. Okay, so A is greater than or equal to 0. G is greater than or equal to 0 on AB <coughs> is less than or equal to F of X. And then just like before, what we're doing is not rotating around the X axis, but the Y axis. And just like when you go from the disk method to the washer method, the answer is just going to be subtract the two things you'd get. Right? If you had rotated the f of x around or the g of x <coughs> around the y-axis. Make sure I don't miss any hypotheses here. Good, good. So we, again, we're going to go around the y-axis. And the volume is going to be 2 pi times the integral from a to b. Okay. Well, if we were just doing this for all of f of x, right, then this would be x times f of x. Right? That's what the shell method would tell us. But we're missing this bottom bit. When we go around, okay, you don't get this bottom bit. So you just subtract what you would have gotten if you'd done it for g of x. So you stick in a little parenthesis. And you go like this. Okay, so this is, this is if, you, if you had just done it for all of f of x, right, if you went all the way to the x-axis, you'd have x f of x. Okay, but you're missing this bit. <coughs> So you subtract it, okay, and that would have been x g of x. Okay, so we call it difference of shells, right? It's the same principle as last time when we went from disks to washers, right? Here, you rotated this around, okay, and so you did the whole thing and you subtract that. Here you're rotating, you can think about rotating this whole thing around, but then subtracting this thing rotated around. So somehow you're, there's really only two base methods. Right? The first one looks at what happens when you take a region in the upper half plane and you rotate it around the x-axis. And the second one says if you take a first quadrant region and rotate it around the y-axis. Okay? And then from that you can build two more methods. One is the washer method, right, where you... <coughs> are allowing yourself not just, I mean, it, the first one should be upper half plane but bounded by the x-axis. This one is bounded by some function, right? And the same thing here. You're bounding by some function. Okay. And of course we can, if we go around the x-axis with functions of y, then the formula is going to be of this form. But you can see, I mean, you don't have to memorize two forms. I mean, they're just the, the same thing. So all you really need to learn to differentiate between, no pun intended, is am I going around the x-axis or the y-axis, and are my functions given in terms of x's or y's? <coughs> right? Where is my region? Okay, what does it look like? Okay? So your task is to go home and look at these pictures and, 
and try to familiarize yourselves with them so that when I draw a function on the board, because no, okay, these look actually much worse than the kind of functions we want to deal with, right? I mean, when I first drew up here, I drew a nice parabola. These are much worse, right? Okay, so the, the, your goal is going to be if I show you a region to be able to identify what situation you're in very quickly. Okay. Tomorrow, uh, we'll work some examples of this, of course. And then we're also going to see what happens when you want to rotate around something which isn't the x-axis or the y-axis. Okay. Say you want to rotate around the line x equals minus 2 or something. Okay. And the answer is going to be very easy. You just turn it back into one of these problems, which is going to be very easy to do.